Amen. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We continue our study on avoiding life's pitfalls. Today's sermon is about what is spiritual maturity. I think this is a pitfall for some of us. We struggle here. We might think that we become overconfident or something about our walk or our faith. And I think this begs for us to look at what Paul is saying here. I think most people would agree that maturity is not determined by age, especially when we're talking about spiritual maturity. Would you agree with that? I would say, I would say amen. Amen? There's a lot of people who think they're mature, but in fact, they're just old. <laughs> I'm getting right there with you. Uh, fixing to go from preaching to meddling right now. And uh, so, you know, I had to run uh, a race with my daughter yesterday. Mercy, I wasn't going to let her run on that course by herself. So I, I got to be the lucky one to run with her for two miles. And I realized how old I was. <laughs> and when she decided, when she started looking over her shoulder, she said, are you going to go with me or not? And she just wanted to take off. And I said, the last quarter mile, I said, you go ahead and go. And just turned her loose. But uh, I realized that uh, I'm getting up there. And the youth is no longer there. <laughs> well, maturity is not determined by age. It's neither determined by actions either. I can control someone's actions if I have authority over them or I'm close to them, like a mom or a dad can have that apparent, can have that authority. And my kids listen to me when I am around. But when I'm not around, sometimes they do things that I'm not necessarily in agreement with. They act differently around their peers than they do around their mother or myself. No, I would tell you this morning that maturity is determined by how we think. And maturity flows out by someone who looks at the world with a sense of biblical maturity. It's not, it is not determined by how long we have been going to church. It's not determined uh, by the fact that you're a Sunday school teacher or that you can preach well or how much Bible you know. Spiritual maturity is always a way of thinking and approaching the spiritual dimension of our lives with other people when we interact. We look at the mindset of Paul as he looks at life. Now, we have some of this idea in, in church today, uh, worship wars. You know what worship wars are? They're like pew poundings. They are when people complain about the color of the carpet. The subwoofers are too large and they're too loud. The music is not right. The version of the Bible that he preaches from is a little weird. Why don't we have pews instead of chairs, by the way? Because I think God likes all this stuff the way it's traditionally meant to be. Jesus certainly is not going to bless Christian rap, is he? <laughs> and we, we have these fights in and among ourselves when we think that that's just uh, inherent to, to the church today. But it's not, as we're about to read uh, in Philippians. Uh, Philippians tells us that they had wars. There's a short history lesson there. Before the worship wars that we are uh, uh, at dealing with, there was worship wars in the church in the first century. And in this particular case, in chapter three, it was about circumcision and diet. Now that's kind of weird, but this is what really was the situation going on in this church as Paul is writing to them. And he is trying to get across to them what is actually going on. He makes these reference to dogs, he calls them in chapter three of these people who are fighting in among themselves to be able to be a certain way. He says, watch out for them, these mutilators of the faith and these guys who are, 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 are cutting people to be able to make them become Christians. Now, the issue was this. Jewish culture had dietary laws. They had all kinds of laws during the time. And one of them was a dietary one. And one of them was that if you're a Jewish male, that you had to be circumcised and it happened on the eighth day. Well, the issue is, if you were a Jewish male, you didn't remember what was going on the eighth day of your life. The problem in this church that Paul's writing to the church at Philippi was these guys are coming in and they're saying, well, if you're going to be a good Christian, you need to eat like we eat. There ain't no bacon. I can't imagine a world like that. He says, there ain't no bacon. And you need to be circumcised. These guys are 34 years old. And this is going to thin out the crowd immensely in this church. Because the guys are like, I don't know that I want to sign up for that camp. But they had taken these old traditional laws into this, this idea that said you had to be part of this. You had to do these things in order to be 
uh, a really good Christian. And so there was a struggle there in there. And Paul is writing to this church and saying, this is a big issue. And the big debate really comes down to, did Jesus fulfill the Old Testament laws or did they or do they still apply today? So this is what we're looking at. Did Jesus fulfill all the Old Testament laws or do they still apply today? I want to remind you of a few things. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah or the Jewish Messiah. So like Christian anti-Semitism is an oxymoron for a Christian to to go against uh, Judaism. This idea of moving the the, uh, the the U.S. council consulate to Jerusalem is a big deal because we are acknowledging them as a nation, and traditionally the United States has acknowledged uh, Israel as as something that we are to stand behind as a Christian as a Christian nation. This is why it's such a huge deal in uh, in the world that that moved to Jerusalem. We can't be a, a person who is on both sides or trying to adhere to both sides of the story as far as whether we're going to stand for uh, Judaism or not. We have to determine whether we are believing in who Jesus Christ actually was. And so the entire world understood and Paul understood as he's writing to the church at Philippi that, that Christ came to the world that God gave his only son for the entire world. And so these Gentiles that are coming in, these guys who are coming in, they changed the name. They called themselves or they called him the Christ. And the Christ is the Greek transliteration of what Messiah means. And this is why they're called Christians in the first century church. Little Christs. They're called Christians. And so this idea that they came in there, Paul's writing this church saying, what are you doing forcing your traditions on these guys who are coming to the church because they are going to be repelled or pushed away from that. That's not what we were supposed to do. Now, when the early church Jewish Christians said, hey, you need to follow our dietary laws. This is what they were struggling with. Well, guess what? They were going to have a tough time growing the church with, with these ideas. Now, the issue is, the key question was, what was their ultimate purpose? What was the ultimate purpose of the early church? These guys, these Christians, as we look at this law. You see, the Ten Commandments, they added a 611 other laws to this. There are all kinds of laws that they were struggling with. And the Jewish people are, are their ultimate purpose. They're not just the Ten Commandments, but the ceremonial laws that they, that they dealt with. All kinds of dietary laws and all kinds of different things. There were laws on how to get fungus off your walls appropriately in your house. In the first five books of the Old Testament, it shows you everything you're supposed to do to do those things. And these Jewish guys are saying, if this is how it was, if this is what it is, this is what you need to do to be a Christian. Now listen to me carefully. Paul's writing to the church of Philippi. He says, no, that is not true. But there are people today in the church, today, 2018, right where we are, that believe that still. They believe that if we do these certain laws, you know, then, then we are good Christians. They see it, and you need to understand that Jewish people saw this as their stairway to heaven. I quote in the rock song. <coughs> and people today struggle with that. When in fact, it was not supposed to be that after Jesus came. Now see, they stuck to the circumcision thing and the dietary laws because they had already had that done to them. They were raised that way. It's like a, a being in a, in a church and you were raised a certain way and, and you have to wear a suit and a tie. But you can't wear hats. And you can't do those things. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't do things that are outside of what tr church tradition says you are to do. And people then struggle, for, uh, struggle with that and they, it becomes a stumbling block for them. The kids got flip-flops on and shorts. You know, I, I hear this today, 2018, right where we are, people come up to me. Doesn't it say somewhere, Pastor? That's how it usually starts out. In the Bible, that you should not mark up your body with tattoos. That's usually a parent who's asking me this. And I say, you're right. It does. Leviticus 18, verse 28. That's what it says. And they go like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they look over at their daughter or their son. Who's right now? And I have to remind that parent, before you get too excited on verse 28, you should read verse 27. Because verse 27 says, you're not to shave. That you're to grow your hair out long on the side and let your beard grow out fully. That men should never shave. So you clean-shaven guys, you're out of line as far as the Bible goes in Levitical law. And they're like, man, 
I said, you cannot take, watch this, you cannot take, watch this, you can't take what you think is going to make you look like a good Christian and then demand that from everybody else around you. Paul's writing the same thing to the church at Philippi. He's saying, hey, you cannot do that. You cannot say, this is the law that we're going to stick to, but you're skipping 600 other ones. You can't pick and choose what is going to be there. And people struggle with that. It becomes a stumbling block to Christianity. This is Paul's point to the church at Philippi. The biblical point to the Old Testament is that they're using that as a stairway to heaven when in fact it is supposed to be a signpost to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So is it a stairway to heaven or a signpost to Jesus? This is a good verse when it comes to someone who is trying to be uh, obscure or trying to become a stumbling block with you. Romans chapter 3, it's in your notes, verse 19 through 20, 23. It says, now we know... Th- that whatever the law says, and he's speaking about the Old Testament law, remember, he's not talking about, uh, the, the Bible has not been put together yet. So Paul, anytime he refers to the scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. Now, whatever the law says, that's the Old Testament law, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. What he is saying is that it's designed to be there so that when we speak of it, we go, oh man, I don't have a leg to stand on. To speak against my brother or sister. In other words, the law is so rigid, it is so superheated, it clearly makes black and white truth that is applicable to all of us. That if we're going to refer to the law, we need to understand that we are subject to that law at the same time. Paul's writing to the church at Rome and he says, hey, you need to understand that if you're going to open your mouth about the law, that you are part of that. That you are subject to the same thing. And that God does not differentiate between your sin and the person's sin sitting next to you. You just all have these bags of S's, if you will. We carry the sin out, and if we dumped it out, it would all be ugly. But he says, that person has it as much as you do. That as Christians, we still sin, and we still need grace, and we still need mercy. So you have to love that individual unconditionally. Justification of faith. In Galatians chapter 3, it's in your notes, it says, Therefore the law has become, watch this, our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. That is the signpost for you and I in our Christianity. Circle that in your notes. It's Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. That that's a signpost for you. It says, this is what the law is for, so that it can be a way for you, a tutor, to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So Paul's saying, no, 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 we're not making Jews, which is what they were asking for with circumcision and this dietary thing. We're making people followers of Christ. And this is the background that that we look at these verses this morning. So look at Philippians chapter three as we look at that verses one through 16. And we're going to see what he's talking about in this maturity. So today's passage is beware. Religion can keep you from knowing God. Beware, because religion can keep you from knowing God. You can get so caught up in religious tradition that you become a stumbling block to the people outside of these walls. And we know that you and I both need grace and mercy. We know we need that. So let's look at these verses. In order to avoid the dead end called rules and rituals, we start with verses 1 through 3. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things again is no trouble to me. And it is a safeguard for you. Apparently, these guys didn't get it the first time. Paul's writing to them and says, man, you are thick headed. This is what it says. I'm going to write this again so that you're sure to understand exactly what's going on here. Beware, verse two, of the dogs. He's obviously happy with these guys. He's calling the people who are shoving tradition down the throats of the people within the church dogs. Beware of the evil workers. It's not a nice word either. Beware of the false circumcision. Now you'll remember in the very first chapter of this, Paul was talking about circumcision of the heart and circumcision of the body, right? And he was saying the individual, when they come to know Christ, their heart is what's circumcised. That's what's changed that individual. This is how we're going to tie the sermon up this morning. For Verse 3, for we are the true circumcision who worship in what? The spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. He puts no confidence in the flesh. We need to understand that. We need to avoid the self-deception called heritage and self-discipline. 
heritage, and self-discipline. Look at verses 4, verse 4 through 9. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, Paul's saying, I am a stud Christian. I know better than you the laws, better than you will ever know. Give you a little background. He studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the best teacher of Judaism in the world at the time. It's like going to the Harvard School of Theology at the time. That's where Paul went. That's where he studied. He was a Pharisee of Pharisee. Watch what he says here in verse 5. Well, again, in verse 4. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, in, the, in my works, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. I am better than you. If you want to go toe to toe, I went to a better school. I did better things. I've done better stuff. I preached in bigger places. I've done all these things that are required of me in the law. But watch what he says, verse five. I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Tribe of Benjamin is a tribe of two tribes of 12 tribes that did the right thing when the other 10 tribes didn't do, do the right thing. He boasts of the fact that he is a Benjamin, he, the tribes that did the right thing. He says, I'm not just a Jew, I'm a Jew with the right tribe who did the right thing all along. <coughs> a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted a loss for the sake of Christ, underlined as loss. So Paul says this, I've done everything that's required of a church going boy since I was eight days old. And first Baptist, first Presbyterian, at first Methodist, as this good kid raised in a church, I did every single thing right. Watch this. But I count it for loss. Watch this. For the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of my surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Underline, suffer the loss of all things. And count them but rubbish, circle the word rubbish, in order that I, might, that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness, that's a $3 word for right standing of God, but having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, in other words, in doing all the, the good works, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, the right standing, which comes from God on the basis of faith. But well, Paul says all these things, and he says, I can beat every Christian at whatever game you want to play. You want to go, you want to play Bible trivia? Let's go. You, you want to do whatever it is that you want to play in the game of Christianity? Let's do it. But he calls it rubbish. That word rubbish that I had you circle, I, I've, I've, I've pointed this word, word out to you before, right in the margin next to it, scubula. That's the Greek word, scubula. S like scuba. L-A, scubula, write that down. Everybody say scubula. scubula. You just cussed in church. <laughs> because that word means fecal matter and it is the slang word for fecal matter. Our slang word, we don't say he was throwing fecal matter. We say other words in this world, right? Paul writes the word scubula and, and I have the translators have a tough time saying the word actually and putting it in print in the King James so they go, the rubbish. And I have the hard time saying the real word for what it stands for. But it's fecal matter. All, watch this, all, watch this. All the things that you've done in your life as a good Christian to make yourself a good Christian. Scubula. It ain't worth anything. The only thing that's going to save you is when you draw the line in the sand and you say, I am going to follow Christ. Amen. I am going to make him my Lord. I'm going to do what is right. I am going to try to do what is right. I'm going to lay down the very things that hold me. And I'm going to break away from them. Take the highway instead called following Jesus. That is what we're supposed to be doing. Following Jesus. Look at verses 10 through 16. That I may know him. The power of his resurrection. 
the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That's what will save me from, uh, from eternity is separated from God is your decision to stand up for Christ and you saying, I'm not afraid to stand up for Christ. I'm going to follow him. He says that is the only thing right there, verse 10, that is going to get you into heaven. All your works. Scuba life. Man. Verse 11, in order that I might attain the resurrection from the dead, I'll have, I will not be dead forever. I will not be separated from God forever. I will have eternal life. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained it. Underline that. This is Paul talking. Not that I have already attained it. I have all the degrees. I've got all the things. I've got all the experience. I've got everything better than any other Christian you put me up against, but I have not attained it yet. Wow. What does that say? This is Paul. He's a stud. It means that Paul understood that he was still a student perpetually in life until he's called home in front of our Lord. Watch this. You and I have not arrived. Amen? Amen. We are not going to arrive until we get into heaven and it says every question is made known to you at that time. Instead, we are perpetual students growing. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. But I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward that lies ahead. Have you ever been stuck in your past? Have you ever been struggling with your past? I've got this problem. I have this issue. I've got this addiction. I've got this, this mess up in my past. I'll never be able to go forward in Christ. I'll never be able to do that because of this thing in my past. That is a bunch of baloney. Satan is a deceiver. He, he's a liar. We talked about that last week. He doesn't want you to think that you can be free. But when in the very thought that you have in that, you're saying what Christ did on the cross was not enough for you. And that is a huge statement. You're saying what Christ did on the cross was not enough. But here's the fact. He died for you because he loves you. And if you were the last person in this world, he would have still went to the cross and died for you. Amen? Amen. The question is, will you live for him? The question is, will we live for him? So here we go, following Jesus. A way to approach spiritual maturity is a manner of what the Bible tells us to do. And, and he tells us how we're supposed to do it. He says, saying, uh, 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 taking on spiritual maturity in which the way, the way the Bible tells us to, we need to ask ourselves, well, consider the loss for the sake of Christ. It's what verse 10 says. So following Jesus, a mature perspective never forgets. And I'm going to give you five things and we'll close this morning. Following Jesus, having a, a mature perspective, never forgets that, number one, as long as I'm alive, I have not arrived. As long as I am al alive, I have not arrived. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying in this passage. Now, this dude's the Apostle Paul. He's well-versed. He's well-educated. He is saying it. His attitude is, as long as I'm alive, I have not arrived. Having this holy dissatisfaction with his life. Understanding that he's never going to get there quite yet until he's in heaven. There are some people who keep beating themselves up. Even this morning, you keep beating yourselves up thinking that I, I just need to clean this one more thing up in my life. And then I'll make a commitment to Christ. Watch this, church. This is where Satan's going to distract you. He wants you to be distracted on that point because Satan wants you to believe you're never going to be good enough to accept what Christ has done for you on the cross. Amen? Amen. But the fact is, he put this gift under the tree for you and there is nothing you can do about it. Your name is on it. You just have to get it. You have to accept it. You have to know and say, God, I, I need Jesus Christ. I need this in my life. You have to come to a place where you say, I understand that I need it. I understand I can't do anything to afford that. I understand I can't fix my life. I understand I can't do anything to make myself whole. It is Christ Jesus alone who can heal all those things. As long as I'm alive, I have not arrived. Number two, I need a mirror more than binoculars. 
I need a mirror more than binoculars. Here's what I mean by that, man. When you hold up a mirror and you look at it, and lately for me, it's a little scary, right? I didn't know I had these jowl things right here. Oh my gosh. I remember seeing my mom in the morning doing this. You know, I found myself in the morning the other day going, what the heck is that all about? That most of my beard when it grows out is gray. And I'm like, wow. And my sideburns that were gray are moving up to the top of my head. <laughs> and when I look in the mirror, I see myself for exactly who I am. Except sometimes as Christians, what we tend to do is not look in a mirror. We pick up binoculars instead and we go, hey, look at that guy. Amen. He needs to fix those nose hairs, man. And we put them on and we look at people and we zoom in. Watch this on their faults. We zoom in on their mistakes. We zoom in on their issues so that we can watch us feel good about our own. But what we really need to do is look in a mirror. Because we got plenty of mistakes and we got plenty of failures and we got plenty of struggles. And we need to say this, watch. Praise God because he has paid for all of that. Amen? Amen. Amen. God wants us to look in a mirror Because it's like, it's, it's called a log eye disease. It comes from Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. How can you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own? And he uses the idea of log. The Greek transliteration is a plank. Having a, like a big old board sticking out of your eye. And he's being humorous about it. Because you're like, poof, poof, knock, knocking people down. Because of this plank in your eye, how can you possibly look at the speck in your brothers? I want you to note something. God sees all the specks in our eyes. Yes. And they're just in fact a speck because what he did on the cross has taken care of them. And you're free from those things. We just have to take our eyes off of other people. Look in the mirror and thank God for forgiving us of where we fail. Amen? Amen? When we have that attitude, when we have that heart, it is a freeing thing. Don't have a log eye disease. We need to be more concerned with ourselves than we need to be with the faults of others. If we are not careful, our spiritual conversations will be about their shortcomings and not our own. That's when an individual is mature when we pick up a mirror rather than binoculars. Amen? Amen? Number three, the right path is seldom the easy path. Did you catch the words in verses 12 through 14? He uses the term, I press on. It's in regard to extreme exertion. The Greek transliteration here is, it is an effort to walk on the path for Christ. I was running this race yesterday and there was a half mile of hills in this race it's the toughest cross-country race in the state of louisiana it's called the battlefield it's out there at at, at a, a national park and you run down into this ravine and basically you have to run up out of it and there's a bunch of louisiana kids who've never seen anything bigger than that in their life they get in there and they're like oh my goodness these kids are coming up to the top of this thing and they're throwing up <laughs> and you're like just trying to get around them and it is, it is hard, it is hard to stay on that path, to not quit. I saw a boy yesterday and, and some of his teammates and some other people from the other schools were saying, man, don't quit, don't stop. He came to the top of the ravine. It's the only hill I was telling him. It's only a half mile from here. You only have a half mile to go. Man, just, just walk it. Walk it and finish it. But he didn't. The look on his face was broken. He was sick. He was throwing up. He looked at the trail that goes on to the race where the other runners were running. And he just was crying. And he walked off. And he stepped over the barricade. And he got out of the race. And he walked back to where his tent was. He didn't finish the race. And God's adamant about us knowing that it is going to be tough in your life. It is going to be hard in your life. You're going to have things happen in your life. You're going to have cancer. You're going to have kids hurt. You're going to have people hurt you. You're going to have things happen in your life. And you're going to want to quit. But you're not supposed to. Amen. Because Jesus says, God says, 
My grace is sufficient for you. What I did on the cross is sufficient for you. And I don't need you to quit. I need you to run in such a way as to win. I love that when Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He didn't say you had to win the race. He says run in such a way as to win. That God's not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to do your best. Well, the right path is seldom easy. There's this idea of EQ, emotional intelligence. They did this test on kids. They would put a little kid in a the room. They'd put a chocolate chip cookie freshly baked. And they told the kid, if you don't touch the cookie when I come back, we're going to give you four cookies. Mm. And these little kids are like three years old, four years old, and they're sitting there. And you watch this, and you can go on Google, and you can Google this. The kid's like looking at the cookie like this. <laughs> He'd lay his head next to it so he could smell. <laughs> One kid went. And so he's not going to touch it. And, with his tongue, one kid dug his finger in one of the chocolates and like picked out a chocolate chip so no one would see if he would eat the chocolate chip. <laughs> Try to leave the cookie. Some kids just went, <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I'm not gonna wait for I'm just I want this cookie. And the study says that kids who have self-control to be able to do that, they've tested later on, 17 years later, were successful in business and life because they had the ability of self-control. And the kids who didn't have self-control were not successful in business. It's a truism, psychologically speaking, and it's true today. Watch this. Listen to me carefully because this is going to hurt. Those that need instant gratification each and every day can never walk in spiritual maturity. Church, listen to me. Those who need instant gratification each and every day can never walk in spiritual maturity. Because you don't have any faith. And without faith, we don't have any hope. We don't know that Jesus really is bringing four cookies. We don't know that he really is going to deliver on his promises. So success isn't forever and failure isn't final. A mature perspective Paul says that I forgot the past. I forget the past on purpose. I don't focus on it anymore. There's two things that get us are our past successes, I think, that seduce us and past failures that sideline us. You're one of those two people. Either you are seduced by your successes. Man, I'm a good businessman. I'm successful. I've got a nice house, a car, and a wife. I, 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 I've got kids who are in college and I'm doing good and I really don't need anything else. And that can be seductive because we think that we don't need Jesus Christ. And then our failures can sideline us. Successes make us put the mirror away and tend to pick up binoculars and think that we are perhaps better than we actually are. I've earned enough chips and God owes me one. Maybe you've come across a person like this in your life. They know the Bible really well. They've been a long time Christian. They teach a class in Sunday school, but there's areas in their life that have a hold on them. They're prideful and arrogant anyway. Their children and family don't like them. But in church, they seem to be like the stellar person who's walking their faith well. This is a person who has become arrogant or prideful in the fact that, man, I have done enough good things as a Christian. I don't have to fix these areas in my life. And those areas in their life become the very stumbling block to the Christians around them. <clears throat> Do we struggle there? Do you think that perhaps because we're good Christians that God owes us one? Even though the marriage is not what it's supposed to be. Even though they're not honest at work like they should be. Even though I know my language stinks in and around the other guys. I know I'm addicted to pornography or a drug or alcohol. And I, I can't break it. 
I know I'm in an inappropriate relationship and I'm sleeping with the person I'm dating. Our success, because we do all the work that we need or necessary in the church, seduces us to thinking that we don't have to fix those things. And God says, listen to me, because this is hard. But you hired me as your pastor, not your friend, okay? God can't bless you like that. He's standing on the porch waiting for the prodigal, you, me, to come home. Saying, I need you to leave the pig trough and come. And it is hard, and it will be hard because the very pride and arrogance you're struggling with, you'll have to leave at your feet. But I'm going to promise you more than four cookies. I'm going to promise you a whole new life. Because that's what Christ has accomplished on the cross. You see, the last question you need to go home with today is this. The best way to follow Jesus is one step at a time. The best way to follow Jesus is one step at a time. As the musicians come and they get ready to play, I'm going to ask you something. 15 and 16 in Philippians says, Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, that word there in Greek means mature, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. What are you doing? Are you listening to God? He wants us to keep a standard that he has set for us, knowing that we're not perfect, but we need his grace and mercy. And you see, you can have that this morning. You can have grace and mercy. You can have that because it is something that he has done for you on purpose. But you have to choose. You have to say, I, I know that I need Christ. I know that I need that. And, and are you mature enough to say? Yes. Are you mature enough to say yes? Because that's what separates children from adults in spiritual maturity. It is acknowledging truth. It is saying, God, I need you. But you are going to have to discern the two voices you have in your head. One is saying, I am speaking to you. And the other one is saying, man, don't do it because someone shows you here, they're going to see you. You just shook hands with the devil. Because what Christ accomplished on the cross, he accomplished it out of love. And that love overrides everything in your past. So if you got to deal with God, you come this morning. You come with whatever decision you got to either accept him as your Lord and Savior, make your profession of faith, or to join in fellowship with this church if God's calling you for such a time as this. But you come and you listen to that still small voice that is calling you out to be separate, to be holy. Let's stand together.